Risk Management Roundup Number 1 10 of my favorite risk-related LinkedIn posts. Dear colleagues, hello. A foundational idea behind Let's Talk Risk is that no one person has all the answers and that when we connect and share our unique insights, we all learn. The practice of risk management is hard. That is why it is even more important to learn from our collective experiences. The challenges we face and the solutions we stumble upon often by serendipity. By sharing these experiences and solutions, we can help elevate our collective competence and make a significant impact through our work in the medical device industry. In this spirit, I've decided to start curating the most interesting and insightful posts I come across on LinkedIn. At this time, I'm not ready to commit to a regular frequency, but I'm going to try to post every other week. If you come across a risk-related post on LinkedIn that you find particularly insightful, please share with me. If it is your own post that you feel really excited about, I'm happy to consider that as well. Here is the first roundup of recent risk-related posts published on LinkedIn that I found especially insightful. I have given credit to each author with a link to their LinkedIn profiles in the notes below. Follow their content on LinkedIn if you are interested. LinkedIn post number one. Brian Whitefield says the job of a risk practitioner is to uncover the elephant in the room. Key point. Risk practitioners need to pay attention to individual differences in risk perception to help uncover some of the inconvenient truths through effective communication. Why it matters. The process of estimating and evaluating risks can be messy, especially when we lack a lot of solid data. Every individual has a different perception of risk, which often leads to intense debates and disagreements when analyzing risks. Some focus on the likelihood of occurrence, others on the impact. Some may overreact, others not so much. Therefore, risk practitioners need to build effective communication skills to facilitate these differences in a productive way and achieve common ground. However, sometimes you do have to let the inconvenient truth stand out, let it simmer a little bit, before you can achieve consensus. Risk management in the end is more about communication. As one of the comment in this post points out, the process of risk management is key. It gets people talking, which creates common understanding of what value, performance and success is. And this applies to the risk of mature company as well as the company just starting out. It is applicable to all. Read the full post in the link below in the notes and continue the conversation. LinkedIn post number two. Anne-Marie Nicholson explains why human factors engineering is more than just a tick box exercise. Key point. Human factors engineering is not just an exercise in documentation and compliance, but a key success factor for a medical device in the use environment. That is why it must be fully integrated throughout the medical device development process and not be treated as an afterthought. Why it matters? Anne-Marie offers a brilliant insight in this post to provide the context behind human-centered design. HFE places users at the heart of the design process. It goes beyond compliance requirements, focusing on understanding user needs, behaviors, and environments. By emphasizing with end users, we create solutions that genuinely enhance their experiences. As medical devices become more sophisticated with high-tech features, it is even more important to focus on the use environment, where use errors and other misuses, whether intentional or not, are inevitable. In this regard, HFE minimizes the impact of potential adverse events, but only if we proactively consider it during the design phase. You can read the full post by following the link in the notes below and continue the conversation. LinkedIn post number three. Chuck Ventura shares tips to accelerate product development with what he calls great design inputs. Key point. Quality of design inputs matters. Good design inputs are like, quote, a well-drawn map of your journey to market, unquote, as noted by Chuck, whose go on to who goes on to emphasize that when we skip these steps, it's like guaranteeing an unplanned roadblock 
and slowing down your project during design verification or regulatory clearance, bottlenecking your progress right when you should be sprinting to the finish line. Why it matters. Many of the problems we see with medical devices in the post-market phase can be traced back to design. Despite an intense focus on design controls over the last 25 years, our industry continues to remain challenged in this area. It helps to spend sufficient time in the planning stage where we should include cross-functional team members, especially those responsible for design verification testing. If we don't have a good idea what to test for, we are likely to stumble when we try to execute the design verification and design validation plans. Chuck shares his prior experience in a response to a comment on this post. Quote, on the R&D side, I have seen too many teams rushing through the design input milestone to claim an easy win and then get stuck in the design verification phase and have delays in product launches. End of quote. It all starts with clearly defining the design inputs. Do it well and you are more likely to succeed in building a product on time within budget and one that will continue to perform reliably throughout its life cycle. Read the full post below by following the link in the notes for the 10 point blueprint that can help you design solid design inputs. LinkedIn post number four. Helen Gerhard invites conversation to understand underlying problems behind recent Philips CPAP issues, especially around design controls. Key point, there has been a lot of media coverage about problems related to certain devices such as ventilators, BiPAP and CPAP machines due to multiple issues leading to multiple recalls since 2021, finally leading to a consent degree and discontinuation of sale of new devices. FDA has consistently provided updates on their website, but there are still a lot of unknowns about the underlying problems, some of which may be related to systemic issues in design, development, post-market changes. This post attempts to encourage an open discussion to help understand some of these issues. Why it matters. Medical device recalls are common, but generally resolve quickly in most cases through voluntary actions by the recalling firm. Philip's case, in particular, has been especially troubling because of ongoing problems and multiple recalls in the last two to three years. As risk practitioners, this case presents an opportunity to learn so we can identify gaps in our own systems and proactively consider appropriate solutions. Based on some of the comments, here are a few issues commonly seen in the industry that often lead to chronic problems. Note that it doesn't necessarily mean that Philips is having these specific issues, but we are talking about these issues here in a more general sense. Poorly written verification plans related to the post that we highlighted in number three above. Second, not treating design history file as a living document. Lack of diligence in design control process for design changes during the post-market phase. Number three, lack of support or other management agenda that adversely impact due diligence in the design or improvement processes. Number four, questionable effectiveness of internal audits. Number five, not understanding the process interactions which reduces the effectiveness of risk controls. Read the full post and comments following the link in the notes below and continue the conversation. Number five, Hatim Rabi shares insights to help estimate sample sizes for clinical studies. Key point. It might be tempting to consider the sample size question only from a statistical point of view. A little bit of preparation to first clearly articulate the clinical and regulatory context for the desired clinical study can help you in selecting the right approach. Why it matters. Clinical studies are expensive and take a lot of time and resources. The primary goal of these studies is to generate scientifically valid clinical evidence of safety and effectiveness. It is important to clearly define the study goals, keeping in mind that more than one clinical study may be needed at different stages of device development. Clearly identifying the primary and secondary endpoints for both safety and effectiveness is also important. Sample size determination should be driven clearly by defined hypotheses as well as practical considerations. Another important factor is the state of the art or SOTA as emphasized in this comment. Quote, Indeed, understanding the state of the art, SODA, and analyzing clinical studies on similar devices can offer significant added value. 
In these clinical investigations, it's crucial that patient sample sizes are meticulously justified and aligned with what is considered reasonable, considering the SOTA and the specific research question at hand. It is also vital that the sample size determination is anchored in a well-defined statistical analysis plan, incorporating a sample size that has been calculated based on rigorous statistical methods. Read the full post and comments using the link below in the notes and continue the conversation. LinkedIn post number six. Vincent F. Cafiso reminds us to follow requirements for rework in light of the recent Boeing 737 MAX issue. Key point. According to recent reports, the Boeing 737 MAX aircraft released to Alaska Airline had missing bolts in the door plug, which likely caused it to blow open during flight. In this case, repair work or rework was done at Boeing factory after receiving the door plug from another supplier. This case is a good reminder to establish documented procedures to control the rework process. Why it matters. Rework is a sign of weakness in the quality system. It suggests that the product was not produced right first time and that it required rework to meet the acceptance criteria. If defective product is released into distribution, it can fail to perform its intended function or in the worst case, result in harm to users. Rework can also have unintended adverse impact on product safety and effectiveness even when it passes the acceptance criteria. As a result, it is critical to have good quality control during the rework process through documented procedures and additional testing or inspection requirements. Clause 8.3.4 in ISO 13485 2016 outlines several quality system requirements for the rework process. Rework is common in the medical device industry. According to one comment on this post, the extent of rework is an indicator of lack of adherence to the quality management system or QMS. Quote, rework in med device, in my opinion, is the thing of dark patching of what should have been a bright red light in the first place prior to releasing it outside the boundary of your control. The extent of your rework usually is concurrent with the extent of lack of adherence to your QMS. End quote. The frequency and extent of rework should be reviewed in management review meetings as an input to the improvement process. If not, there is a likelihood of receiving a 483 from the FDA. Read the full post and comments in the link in the notes below and then continue the conversation. LinkedIn post number 7. George Zach highlights a common software testing trap in medical device design and development. Key point. In a series about the software testing trap, this post highlights a common industry challenge where software testing is not considered early enough in the requirements definition phase. Why it matters. A major challenge when software testing is not considered early enough is that design requirements may not be really testable. When software testing is seen only as a task in the overall development process, the focus is on getting it done fast rather than doing it right. This often leads to poorly executed test plans and potentially ineffective risk controls. As highlighted by a comment, in this case, from a 13485 perspective, the first mistake is not paying attention to the second sentence of Clause 7.3.3, where it requires that design inputs, that is requirements, be reviewed for adequacy and then goes on to specifically require that are able to be verified and validated. The second mistake comes in missing the part of 7.3.4 in ISO 13485 that requires design outputs, that is specifications, to include acceptance criteria. Tough to do the second without doing the first correctly and fully. Read the full post and comments following the link below in notes and continue the conversation. LinkedIn post number 8. Corey Johnson discusses human factors issues in medical software with Xenophone Papa Demetris. Key point. At the most basic level, human factors is about clearly understanding and managing risk at the human device interface in the use environment. More importantly, it is a mindset that needs to be incorporated in the design process and throughout the device lifecycle. Why it matters. Medical device software is evolving fast, both in technological sophistication and real-world application. Regulatory authorities are also catching up with explicit requirements for documentation in pre-market regulatory submissions. However, it would be a mistake 
to treat this as a check the boss activity. Human Factors Engineering Report as a summary of the overall body of work throughout the development process. An important component of this report is the Human Factors Validation Study to demonstrate effective and safe use of a medical device. A second component is a use-related risk analysis, a subset of the overall risk analysis to identify and manage all potential risks related to the use of the medical device software. As Corey explains in this YouTube interview, quote, a co common misconception is that if you just do those two things, you are good. That is possible to fake, but it is pre pretty evident when it's not done. The products and organization who embrace the human-centered design through the development process and who incorporate human factors early in that process recognize that the human factors engineering report is not just to do it at the end of the thing that you do the check the box. End quote. In the age of artificial intelligence or AI, there are implications for how human factors engineering research is conducted and how incorporation of AI affects risk, especially from the user experience point of view. Trust and ethics are two important factors that impact fundamentally the user experience. Artificial intelligence machine learning is an active area of innovation that will shape both the extent and regulatory requirements for use of AI in medical device future. Listen to the full interview on YouTube following the link in the notes below and continue the conversation. LinkedIn post number nine. Wag Hanna reminds us that risk management is not about eliminating risk. Key point, it is rather about being ready to respond and take action when necessary. Why it matters? There is no such thing as zero risk. Risk is always present as a potential for an adverse event or alternately an opportunity for gain. Commonly used risk acceptability criteria such as ALARP or as low as reasonably practical, ALARA, which is as low as reasonably achievable, and AFAP, which is as far as possible without adversely affecting the benefit risk ratio, acknowledge that risk cannot be reduced to zero. We can only get to a certain level considering the state of the art and the anticipated benefits of the intended use of a device. Risk management in the end is a decision-making process. Have we considered all potential hazards and hazardous situations and their associated risks? Have we considered all appropriate risk control measures and implemented them effectively? Do we have a plan and process in place to continually monitor changes in estimated risk levels and new risks? Risk management then is a continuous practice, not an end goal. We get better at it by doing it well. And when we do, well, magic happens. As highlighted in this post, quote, the magic happens when you manage risk wisely, using it as fuel for innovation and growth, end quote. Read the full post and comments following the link below in notes and continue the conversation. Finally, LinkedIn post number 10. On a lighter note, did you know that the modern approach to risk really began with a gambling problem? Who doesn't want to win a bet? Millions of Americans are going to bet billions of dollars on the Super Bowl game this year between the San Francisco 49ers and Kansas City Chiefs over the weekend. Risk taking is often driven by a deep desire to win rather than methodically calculating the odds to make risk based decisions. Why it matters? Risk based decisions should be driven by a careful analysis of available information in the context of organizational priorities. After all, risk is a combination of likelihood of occurrence of an outcome, whether it's a win or a loss, and its impact. However, this is not our practice in many situations. Our gut feel often misleads us into over or underestimating risk because often we focus on the impact regardless of its likelihood. At other times, we tend to ignore the likelihood of occurrence because we are not too concerned of the outcome. Risk perception matters. Whether something is risky or not depends to a large extent on how an individual perceives the impact likelihood equation. It is interesting to note that the science of probability was driven in part by questions raised by those who wanted to win a big bet. Check out Peter Bernstein's book, Against the Gods, The Remarkable Story of Risk for a fun read on this topic. Read the full post and comments following the link in the notes below and continue the conversation. 
Well, colleagues, these were the 10 key posts that I came across on LinkedIn that caught my eye and I found them very interesting. I hope you like my commentary on these posts and I hope you will follow the links in the notes below to learn more about these conversations and add your voice to the discussion. Tell me in the comments below if you like this type of a curated content about risk-related topics and if you would like me to continue in this voiceover format. I hope within just a span of 15-20 minutes you can catch up with the most insightful conversation on, link on LinkedIn happening about the topic of risk. So let me know in your comments any feedback you might have and also share with me your favorite LinkedIn post that I covered in this article.